Nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tuum di arbus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater de Dere, pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Nomine Patris et Filii Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laude to Jesus Christus. In secula. This is Timothy Flanders. This is the Terror of Demons morning show, reclaiming traditional Catholic masculinity. Joined, as always, by co-host Kennedy Hall. How you doing, brother? Wonderful. How are you? Excellent. It's a wonderful morning. Just a reminder, if I can pull this out of my stuff, just a reminder, <clears throat> Terror of Demons, the book is available <clears throat> below by Kennedy Hall here with us today. So today's topic is Christ against racism. This is a very important topic, and the reason is because on this day in the United States is <laughs> Martin Luther King Day, and so many American bishops will be proclaiming their anti-racist, uh, you know, that they are anti-racist. Uh, we are also heading into a regime of Marxists who enjoy using the term racist as a political denunciation for people they don't like. Yeah. So we're going to try to define today what is racism. We're going to try to define some of the history interacting with the economic institution tied to racism, namely slavery. Yep. And we're going to attempt to show that Christ in the Catholic Church is the social, political, economic, and most importantly, theological answer to racism. And moreover, there is a great deal of confusion with racism. And just like all heresies, there is a mixture of truth and error. Yep. And I think it's very dangerous today. I think this topic is very dangerous today because perhaps more than any other error today, Maybe feminism and, and racism are really closely linked in this sense because there's a great deal of truth in feminism with a great mixture of error. Right. And in the <clears throat> the the Marxist sort of attempt to condemn racism, there's a great mixture of truth and error there as well. Yeah, that's the way it always is with Marxism. Like um, one of the episodes we just put out at the Fatima Center was about, you know, how the communists would infiltrate a society. And one of the ways that they would do that would be through the labor relations, because there is a great deal of truth in the industrial revolution that the average man was exploited. That's true. Um, you know, wage slavery became a thing and a different type of slavery. Um, <clears throat> but you take that partial truth of yes. Okay. Men are basic. I mean, in a way of societal inertia against basically any, uh, you know, protection that that individual sort of peasant has he was taken off his farm he was put into the cities he was put into bad factories i mean it was a bad time for him in a lot of ways that turns into you know the employer class wants to uh, suppress you as the employee class and therefore we need to have a class struggle and rise up and take over and whatever and that becomes the whole you know revolutionary thing but it's partially true so but the solution was not marxism so with racism, it is true that um, it is true, 100 percent, that there have been instances and they've existed in all cultures. I think that's one thing to keep in mind for people, you know, <clears throat> like racism in the purest sense is evil because it's obviously, you know, if, if human beings are made in the image and likeness of God, there is an aspect to racism where it is hatred of God. You know, like if you hate someone because of the, the different kind of human they are. I mean, they're, we're all made in the image and likeness of God, so there's a problem there, okay? But I think it's important for people to keep in mind that it's not a, and we'll talk about this because I know you have a, a great background in this, but it's not a problem that is relegated to one group of people. Um, that's one thing that I learned. Uh, weirdly, I mean, I grew up regular kid, high school, and sort of had the narrative of all the things you hear. Then I went off to university to a very multicultural city, in um, Ottawa, Ontario, international city, you know, by definition, because of the capital, you know, the parliament being there and got to know people from different countries, diplomats, kids and things. And I realized that all cultures all over the world have
have their various, um, you know, let's say in, uh, you know, intricacies or what's the word I'm looking for. They have their unique characteristics of races of people that they generally like and don't like. And this is not, this is not something that is unique to Europeans at all. It's a thing that's amongst all people. Hence why it's in the Bible, which we'll talk about. Yeah. I was just thinking of this quote from Russell Kirk in the American cause uh, page. 119 he says this in every age there is much human discontent and in nearly every age there arises some revolutionary movement which takes advantage of that discontent exactly and we're going to see later on i think it's very interesting how the marxists took advantage of the actual racism that was happening and blew it into sort of this apparent racism that they're promoting now so but Without further ado, let, the important uh, important thing we need to do is try to define our terms because the Marxists don't want to define racism. They just want to throw racist, racist at people. So what is racism? You, you got into this a little bit uh, and I, I tried to, I was wondering your take, Kennedy, <laughs> because it seems to me that there are, there are basically two forms of um dignity philosophy, if you will. I'm not sure if there's a, there's a term for this philo- philosophical sort of area but as the essential of defining human dignity there is dignity based on voluntarism and dignity based on logos dignity based on voluntarism is essentially you're only as good as what you can do you're you're as you are what you can do so therefore an unborn child can't do anything so to speak so unborn child can be killed or we enslaved you so since you're a slave, you can't do anything. Well, you must be subhuman then. Or yeah. you're Chinese and you can't speak Japanese. Well, you can't. If you can't do that, then obviously you're subhuman. Or it's right. basically all on. It's based on what you can do. Now, the color of one's skin is. We're going to get into that a little bit. There's a error that was promoted from the Bible. Um, but uh, the color of your skin is sort of what you can do because you can't do anything, but it's also part of what you are. But dignity based on uh, logos is that you're created in, in the image of God. You, uh, the, the Latin mass says that God marvelously ennobled man yeah. by his very creation. Mm-hmm. And so no matter what you can or cannot do as a human being in terms of your actual abilities, it's, that's irrelevant to the question. It's irrelevant. If you are a human, you have your nobility, your dignity as a human being, period. It has, it has nothing to do with what you can do. Yeah, it is ironic. Um, we live in an extremely voluntaristic age. Uh, we're materialists. We're rationalists. We're we're everything but Christian now. We're also we're neo pagans, but at the same time, we're atheists. We're a bunch of idiots, um, and that's exactly the argument that's used for abortion. Is a voluntarist argument that while you're not really capable of the same things that a grown person is capable of, therefore you don't, you know, you don't contain the same right to be alive as that person because your life has less value. In the most extreme senses, you see that with. Um, with like Peter Singer, you know, that, um, that philosopher. And there's actually a famous one from the city I grew up in in London, Ontario. He is a professor there. He argued, he had a debate with, um, what's her name? Not Steph Nicholas. Um, <clears throat> that pro-life speaker, she's a woman and she's kind of famous. Like she's, you know, Catholic answers, that kind of thing. Stephanie Gray. There it is. Stephanie Gray. Um, she's pretty good. She's a good, good uh, speaker on it. And she had a debate with him. And he, and I think it's online actually, but he is the kind of guy who argues that up until a year, if you're handicapped or something, you could be infanticide, but they call it post birth abortion or something. It's ridiculous. Um, But that's voluntarist. And that argument ironically is used to extinguish so many people of non-European races. And it's lauded as some sort of, and this is the whole Planned Parenthood problem, which, you know, Margaret Sanger herself was quite a racist. Um, she was, she was extremely racist. I mean, I, I was reading some quotes that I did for my evolution series this summer for the Fatima Center. And, yeah, the Negro Project. Yeah, and like, I'm Italian. I got a little bit triggered because she said something like, you know, there's the whites and then there's the Jews and Italians are just above the blacks. And I'm like, whoa, 
<laughs> yeah, but she but she was so she was so um she was so into the eugenic philosophy she was such a darwinist yeah that's yeah that's, so, i mean that that's that goes right into our our the idea of cosmology because it, yes. if if the modern marxist liberals want to assert that we should not be racist well why should we not be racist marxist if you right. believe that there is no god and we right. all evolved from apes and all these different races are populated by these different people groups who were all survival of the fittest. Why not be a racist? <clears throat> Let me read you a quote here from Darwin. Uh, two quotes. Okay. And this, I mean, these are, there's lots of them. Um, it's hard to find them though. I, it was easier for me to find them earlier, but you know, the internet, it likes to be um, open for uh, intellectual thought and debate. So it always hides things that are really important. Yeah. <clears throat> This is Darwin, he says, and this is from this, The Descent of Man. That was um, the, the Origin of the Species is the one book he wrote on sort of the theory. The Descent of Man is more of a uh, historical framework, I should say. <clears throat> and he says, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, he's a prophet, you see, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. At the same time, the anthropomorphous apes, as Professor Schaufhausen has remarked, will no doubt be exterminated. The break will then be rendered wider, for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we may hope, than the Caucasian and some ape as low as a baboon, instead of as at present between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. So that's pretty rude. Um, but you can see there he basically is looking at uh, human beings as this sort of hierarchy of, I don't know, voluntarist worth or whatever from the sort of actual apes through the various races of people and he views um you know like africans and um australian aborigines as kind of the lowest on the totem pole and you get to the civilized races and things but he goes on there's another quote that he has that shows how he wants to exterminate them he says i could show a fight on natural selection having done and doing more for the progress of civilization than you seem inclined to admit Remember what risk the nations of Europe ran not so many centuries ago of being overwhelmed by the Turks. Just a little pause here. He's anti-Catholic, but he's happy that Europe didn't become the Turks anyway. Read your history, buddy. Continuing, and he says, and how ridiculous such an idea now is. The more civilized so-called Caucasian races have beaten the Turkish hollow in the struggle for existence. Looking to the world at no very distant date, what an endless number of the lower races will have been eliminated by the higher civilized races throughout the world. And this is Charles Darwin, uh, Origin of the Species? Darwin. Is that the first the... one? The first quote was Descent of Man, and the second quote, I don't know. It's just I looked up quotes of Darwin, you know. I've got, yeah, I was going to get, I have the, the book by, published by Ignatius called Architects of the, of the Culture of Death. There's a, there's a <laughs> chapter on Darwin, and it has all the references for viewers if you want to look up the particular quotes from Origin of Species. Um, and that gets into a very, very strong distinction that we have between civil civilization as the Catholics understand it mm -hmm. and civilization as the Anglos understand it, the, the her heretical Anglos, because the biggest difference between um, the colonial powers of New Spain or New France and New England is that the new Spanish, the Spanish, especially in the Spain, because there's far more people and far more Indians, they all married each other mm -hmm. and they're created a mestizo race to the point that most Hispanics today are mestizo. They have some sort of blood. There's, there's a lot of different color differences in a single Hispanic family. There's darker Hispanics or lighter Hispanics in a single family. Mm -hmm. That's because of the mestizo race. And that's something that he completely heals racism because you marry each other. You yeah, have you a, you tend to like each other. You have a public wedding yeah. that is, is affirming the mixture of these races as ordained by God, as blessed by God and blessed by the people. It's really hard to create a racial ideology when that's happening to everybody. Now compare that with new England mm -hmm. in new England. They were, Killing the, killing the Indians, moving them out of their lands. They were keeping the slave, the African slaves, and they had what's called shadow families, which is where people like Thomas Jefferson fathered six children from his wife's half-sister, who was also his slave, 
because he inherited this slave from when he married his wife, Jeff Jefferson. And so you, you could just destroy the African family by abusing them sexually. Mm-hmm. And this and, and mixing the races was totally taboo. You couldn't you couldn't have wow. this uh, this public wedding. There was no mestizo race created in the United States. It was it was all this taboo sexual abuse basically happening behind the scenes between whites yeah. and blacks. And so you have you have this this very very strong and the sort of the civilization the civilizing nature of this ideology in New England was heretical. Whereas you know the the Catholics are civilizing in terms of we're take you know we're taking the guani out of the 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 jungle, and we're teaching them how to farm so that they don't starve because they're killing their children. They're aborting their their infanticide because they're starving. Yeah. And so we're saying, okay, well we're going to teach you how to farm so you don't have to start you don't have to starve. And you're not going to kill your children, and you're yeah. also not oppressed by devils anymore. We're going to teach you the Catholic faith. And then we're going to intermix with everybody. Everybody's going to intermarry. We're going to create a new race and a new culture. Now, the New England version is, well, you you Indians are savages. We're just going to kill you, move you off your land, take over your land because we are a higher race than you are. Yeah. Or the Africans, we're not going to mix with you at all because you're a lower race. You have the curse of ham. So yeah. <clears throat> you should just be enslaved. Yeah, and it's, um, this is, you know, Oh man, this is why, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of like, there's this expression like two bit history, you know, like cheap history is so dangerous because the history of the relationship and the interaction between European settlers and indigenous peoples is so much more complicated than people want to give it credit for. And one of the things that the Marxists do is they whip everybody up into a frenzy of pinning it as just like colonizers and colonized, okay? Um, which is also weird that the word colony has become an epithet. I mean, a colony just basically means for people have a community. I mean, it's it's just it, the colony could be good. The colony could be bad. It's neither. It may not even good. involve indigenous people at all. It might just be. Yeah, it's I mean, a colony on Antarctica. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I mean, when Canada was um, Canada. Yeah, Canada is very sparsely populated, as you said. The, the highest estimate was 500,000. And that's high. That's sort of like a very modern sort of. That's a real. That's not. That's not really based in much history. It's probably closer to 100 to 200 thousand people, in the whole country, and Canada's massive. You could walk for a month and a half and not see another person if you were a, uh, you know, a, a Jesuit missionary or something. So I mean, there could be colonies where there was absolutely nobody. Anyway, um, but when you look at the history, we talked about this with Charles Coulomb, um, and actually in the States, there was one mestizo sort of thing. And that was in Louisiana, which was French. <laughs> it was a Creole. So that's the one. Exactly. So it proves the point. But um, <clears throat> and probably somewhere in California. I mean, there were Protestants, there were Protestants intermarrying with Indians and blacks. It, don't get me wrong. Well, but be- it was yeah. simply not a dominant cultural influence. No. And it was taboo. It was yeah. taboo. And there's that movie with um, Matthew McConaughey. The Free State of Jones. It's actually a half decent movie, and um, because you know it's it's kind of a, a uh, I don't I can't believe Hollywood made it because it actually made Democrats look bad and made Republicans look good, um, and it shows uh, that's a good anyway it's a good, decent movie actually. But um, in any case, uh, the, the history of of the European peoples with the indigenous peoples is so and again watch our video with Charles Coulomb. It is so complicated. It's so complex because. You know, people will say, well, there was these, um, uh, you know, French Catholics and they had a conflict with this native group. It must have been racism. And it's like, no, because like the French Catholics immediately started marrying another indigenous group. It's just that the one indigenous group did not want them. You know, it was like they were uh, like all peoples. They had, um, you know, an evil streak to them. And you know, were very ruthless towards even their fellow indigenous, you know, peoples that lived with them. And it was the same thing in Mexico. I mean, there's yeah. a reason, there's a reason why um, everybody in Mexico, except for the Aztecs, sided with the Spanish. <laughs> like everybody, <laughs> you know, Cortez, Cortez was a military genius. He really, I mean that, like, if you read the history of what he did, um, they, I mean, they literally made almost like Ikea boats, where they would carry in the pieces and they were labeled with symbols and things where they could put the boats they portage these massive things so they could 
you know, assemble the boats by the river and attack the city from different angles. It was really remarkable. But he did that with the help of like tens of thousands of natives who hated the Aztecs because they were tired of getting their hearts cut out and sacrificed to the gods. Um, so the history of, of people um, coming together at, at colonization is way more complex than people want to give it credit for. It is way too simple to put it as Europeans versus non-Europeans because that's not the way it worked out at all. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, there's multiple different tribes of Indians in North and South America, and they're all warring against each other. Yep. Newsflash, they, they were racist against each other. They, were, they slave, enslaved each other. <laughs> they enslaved each other. <laughs> I mean, this, the slavery, the slavery and the racism is going in all directions between all sorts of different people. It's not certainly not white and black. Speaking of which, the slave trade up until 1430s, 40s, 50s, was actually from Africa. Yeah. The Arabs in Africa were coming to enslave the Europeans. Yeah. But let, let me get into that in a second, um, because I wanted to go all the way back to the New Testament really quickly and just touch yeah. on a few things, because essentially what happens in so slavery and and sort of a racist based slavery is universal throughout all ancient civilizations. Every ancient civilization had slavery or some sort of racist ideology here and there. And obviously the economics of slavery when you're benefiting and you're getting money by slavery, you are motivated to create some sort of racist ideology to justify your actions. And especially the reason is because you can know by natural reason that this slave is actually a normal human being like you. And the reason is because if you look at the Roman Empire with Seneca and the Stoic philosophers, they were already figuring out that Aristotle was wrong because Aristotle had said that a slave is sort of a subhuman and he's a, sort of a natural slave. He's born a slave. Yeah. He said the same thing about women. Women are misbegotten men. And yeah. the, the Stoic philosophers were already just figuring out by, based on natural reason. Well, this is, this is not really the case. I mean, obviously, this person's rational just like us. There's not, there's not really a difference in terms of human nature. So <laughs> when – and there's also the concept of a Roman citizen. So in the Roman Empire at the time of our Lord, the distinction is not so much whether or not you are a Greek or a Roman or a Scythian or a barbarian. That is not as much – you had barbarians of the army. People were becoming Roman citizens. That was really the, – the distinction was between a Roman citizen and a non-Roman citizen. And you could – in theory, you could, you could be any race and become a Roman citizen. And yep. later on, there were former slaves who became popes because of this, this idea – coming it was a melding of the greco-roman culture and the mosaic culture the mosaic culture in the law of moses mitigated slavery it uh, was the cosmology of it was freed slaves out of egypt who were 12 different tribes who were 12 distinct races yep you had a benjaminite and a judahite and they weren't allowed to marry each other so they were totally different races 12 tribes within one people and they were not allowed to enslave each other a slavery was abolished. Now they tolerated slavery of other races <clears throat> outside Israel. But if you had a slave, you had to circumcise your slave. Your slave was, had to rest on the Sabbath. You couldn't work your slave seven days a week. And if you couldn't mistreat your slave either. So there was already a, a toleration and a mitigation that was based on a, a, an inherent dignity of the slave's human nature. Um, but I just wanted to mention, basically, the way that the church abolishes slavery is that they, they come in and the church says it. Uh, I, and I never realized this until I was researching this, but St. Paul does actually condemn that. Then we get into the distinction that you wanted to make was yeah. between a, a domestic sort of a domestic slavery. Where a dentured you, servitude. We might, I'm almost a dentured servitude, uh, basically a slave and his family and his children are just sort of a part of the family. It's sort of a family yeah. thing where they're part of the family. And you, you provide for all their needs and they work for you. Yeah. It, you protect them. They work for you. It's a slavery and, and they obey you. There is a master and slave relationship and that, yeah. but it's, it's much more of a sort of a family affair. They're part of the family in some sense. And then on the other hand, there are the slave traders and they go Cow off slavery. by violence and they take people, they kidnap them and they take them and sell them. Mm -hmm. Now that thing is condemned by St. Paul in first 
Timothy for uh, one ten. Now, unfortunately, in a lot of Bibles, this is the tra- the word is just translated as kidnappers. He condemns yeah. kidnappers. But what do kidnappers do? And I, I looked this up in the Greek and Latin. It is clearly slave trader. This right. this term. I'll give you the I'll give you the Latin just for viewers, if anybody cares. Uh, when I have a second, but, shout out Ryan Grant. He's like, I don't believe you. Say it to me in Latin, or I won't understand. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, the, I'll the find this in a, sec- in a second. But basically, the church condemns this type of chattel slavery, which is uh, made by unjust violence of taking somebody. Uh, but they allow, they permit this domestic slavery, and they say, slaves mm-hmm. obey your masters, masters love your slaves, and then they abolish the metaphysical distinction between men. And yeah, so they and, say, and, you and, are both brothers. You both have one master. Yeah. You both have one master, which is the Lord. And they, they baptized the, the, the famous episode of Philemon and Onesimus. Onesimus was an escaped slave. Onesimus ran to St. Paul. St. Paul converted him. And St. Paul said, go back to your master and reconcile to him mm-hmm. and present yourself as a slave once more. And this was actually a reconciliation. This is this is the way that the church abolished slavery every time, is that yeah. they reconciled slave and master. Mm-hmm. Instead of later on, the heretics will use bloodshed to, which would just cause bitterness and destruction to yeah. abolish slavery. But the church abolished slavery by reconciling slave and master as brothers, which eventually, both in the Eastern Roman Empire in Constantinople and in the West by 1200, 300, 1300, there is just an abolishment of slavery. Slavery just sort of becomes a servitude, a serfdom. It, it's just, it sort of just div- dissolves in, in civilization. Yeah. And um, it's interesting, on- Onesimus. So uh, and another example of where Catholicism heals the uh, relationship between slave and the enslaved and the slave and the sort the slaver and the, insla- and the enslaved. Onizem, Onizim is a famous French Canadian name or a common French Canadian name. So in Catholic culture, it's actually common to name the name of that converted slave has dignity amongst Catholic cultures. Uh, Maurice Richard, we talked about with Charles Coulomb, his dad was named Onizim Richard. So he was named after that. Um, and I, and, and again, I think I'm going to, I'm going to clarify. I want, I just want to do like two second here of, um, understanding what indentured servitude is okay we have this whole group of people called the slavic peoples the, okay the word slave that we use comes from this word slavic because at a certain time uh in roman times basically the vast majority of people who would become indentured servants of upper roman classes would have been from this area of slovenia um and further east okay that's where most of them came from romania etc ironically it's still common today in italy for many people from that uh, play, part of the world to come and work in you know almost the same way that migrants from the south america will come to work in, in the states in any case indentured servitude what they're talking about in the bible people need to understand that all of virtually 90 percent of people would have been some sort of servant um because before you have stabilized sovereign states for the most part, you know, you had empires, you had city states, but there was so much sort of like wild west everywhere. This is, you know, so outside of these stable places, these stable city states, you basically just had, well, unstable places with nomads, agriculturally based economies, etc. So one of the ways of having stability was to be part of a basically a tribe. And if you weren't born into it, then a lot of the time, most of our ancestors, I mean, it's, I'm Italian background. 99% certain that my family must have been some sort of indentured servants back in the day, in some case, as everybody was. You would actually voluntarily bring yourself into that because it was a form of stability. Um, and uh, as economics change over time, you have more currency, you have a greater uh, equity of, of application of that currency in society. You have an ability to make a salary, to make a wage, and so forth. You have an ability to buy property. And all of these things were worked out very slowly and prudentially from the Roman times of having all indentured servitude to the feudal system of having one lord who owned tons of land and had a very reasonable leasing of that out to the peasant. And in a sense, that was kind of a servitude as well because you basically had your land for next to nothing, but you owed the master 
30, 40 days of work a year to help with this harvest. That really is not much different than it was in Roman times, but you don't call it slavery, you call it feudal system. Then we transition from there, different property rights and so on and so forth. All of these things are because the church understood human nature, understands human nature, and applied prudential applications of how to do this gradually to create stability in society. And as, and as groups of people are continually cleansed by sanctifying grace, they are more, the intellect becomes more enlightened and they see things more clearly. And grace perfects nature. So this nature that is imperfect is then slowly perfected by the application of sanctifying grace. And that's why in the church, you've essentially had this acceptance of an institution that was already there. And, um, and then you have this perfecting of these institutions to the point where you have a natural inequality between peoples, but it's not applied through some sort of chattel slavery. And, and that's uh, the legacy of the church in curing the ills of it, chattel slavery, but not radically, you know, if you just say to everyone in Rome, you know, Christianity comes and it's like, every slave is free, go do what you want. It's like, they don't own anything. I mean, servants, they don't own anything. So they would have to go back to their, they would just have to go back. They wouldn't want it. Why would you want it? Um, you know, there'd be no point. I mean, you're going to leave this place that you work, that you till, that you have a uh, family on, that you live on, that you have a place on, um, where you have stability, where your children grow up, where you have food. And you're going to be go an and, economic crisis just to abolish it. Well, they would all go starve. I mean, yeah. and, and they'd all have to go war with each other and they'd probably enslave each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, because then, you know, the, the cream would rise to the top and the stronger, whatever. So this is, it's, it's so much more complicated than, uh, and it's also, again, it's not chattel slavery, which is the evil that we see with the transatlantic slave trade. Right. And the, and the feudal serfs worked less and had more security than I do. Yes, exactly. Basically, we, we have uh, in our, in our day, we work 40 hours a week, which a uh, feudal serf had an average of more than two days off per year or per week. Sorry. Um, yeah. And well, this is another topic, but we basically you didn't, have, you didn't get opulent, to vote. we have, <laughs> yeah, we have opulent luxury, but we yeah. have, we work, have to work more mm -hmm. and we have less security. But I, I wanted to mention the, the word here in um, first Timothy one ten. Mm -hmm. This is one of those lists where St. Paul says, neither the fornicators nor the sodomites nor the, yeah, this yeah. nor the, that can inherit the kingdom of God. And he, one of the, things he mentions is the uh the word is uh andropodistis which comes from andropodizo which means to reduce to slavery and slave sell the free man of a conquered place into slavery uh be sold into slavery so an andropodistis is a slave dealer or kidnapper mm -hmm. who goes in and takes someone by violence to sell them into slavery so meanwhile so what what uh what kennedy was just was delineating here the history of, of of the abolishment the gradual abolition of slavery in the eastern and western christendoms especially in the west you're talking about the feudal system um this was happening and expanding as people were being converted mm -hmm. people were being converted these different pagan tribes barbarian tribes in the in the western europe and the they were these tri tribes who were used to slavery were being Christianized, and then they were they were into being integrated into the system of rights and duties, mutual rights and duties between uh, lords and vassals, and and all this, very central, very decentralized. And meanwhile, there's there are two different slave trades going on. One is the Vikings, so yeah. that was the big issue, uh, especially starting in the, in the 900s, 1000s. And the, the Vikings were coming, raping and pillaging, taking slaves. So that was happening all over Europe because of the slaves from Scandinavia. Now, eventually, these slaves were converted. There was actually a northern crusade against the Vikings. I didn't even know that. But um, these Vikings were converted to the faith, and therefore, the slave trade with them was ending. Meanwhile, and you have various councils where they're condemning the slave trade in the 1100s. But in the meanwhile, you had the Arabs who had conquested North Africa and they created, and I'm not sure maybe any viewers, I, I could not find the idea of the curse of ham as a justification for slavery, except in a Mohammedan source as, as the ori origin. I couldn't find the origin of the curse of ham. So mm -hmm. the idea is there are three sons of Noah. Okay. So Noah goes in the ark, God floods the world. Everyone dies except for Noah and his three sons. Now Noah's three sons are Japheth, Seth and Ham. <clears throat> now, 
in the text, Ham commits a sin against Noah. He sees his father's nakedness. Now, some believe this is a euphemism for usurping his father's throne and sleeping with his mother. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the best interpretation, in my opinion, because what happens is Noah curses the son of Ham, whose yeah. name is Canaan. And Canaan is the, the, or the father of the Canaanites who are the ones inhabiting the Holy Land who are, who are uh, kicked out and destroyed by the sons of Shem, specifically mm -hmm. Abraham, Sem, Shem's son, mm -hmm. the, the Israel, obviously. Um, and mm -hmm. the idea is that the Canaan, the idea is that Ham committed incest with his mother and that, that union produced Canaan. Therefore, Canaan is cursed because his whole line is, is a, an evil line. Where there are, there are other sons of, of Ham, for example, Egypt is a son of Ham. And so the, the idea is that Egypt, the, the sons of Egypt, the, sons, the other sons of Ham inhabited the Af what we call continental Africa today. So that's where the sons of Ham went. And then there's the sons of Shem, who are Israel and the Ishmaelites are also sons of Shem. They inhabit Arabia. And then there's the sons of Japheth, who are all of Europe. And then there's some question I couldn't tell the the far Easterners that what we what people would usually call hundreds of years ago the Orientals, so yeah. the, the modern day Chinese and Japanese. Some say they're sons of Japheth. Some say they're sons of Shem. There's so there's some question. I don't know if you've heard that Kennedy or not. I have actually. There's a oh, hard to find it. A sermon on census medallion by Father Wolf. And he goes through, um, there's a Chinese culture, two things. One, the, uh, it's said that the word Jupiter, the god Jupiter, is actually etymolo etymologically linked to Japheth. It's sort of an, um, so they worship, uh, it's interesting to go back and they actually basically worship uh, the son of Noah because they, because that, because mm. we are from this, it's, we are from interesting. this because of after the flood, the only families left, whatever. But there's a culture in China where they have, a wedding ceremony where um, Father Wolf was reading an English translation of it. It sounded like he was reading a translation of the Bible and it was talking about the flood, the Japheth, the sons, Noah, et cetera, coming down to, and they get married and it basically sounds like they sound like it sounds like a completely lost biblical culture in China, which apparently didn't have contact. So, okay. But just clarification, people, um, the Canaanites obviously being um, um, the sons of Ham, but he also, so he has illegitimate children with his mother, one interpretation, but he also has his own children from his own wife or wife or wives, which is um, Egypt, et cetera. So what you're saying is that basically there's a misapplication of this cursed sons of Ham, the Canaanites, but all, but people are saying all sons of Ham have this same curse. Yeah. So I, I don't know if, if viewers, if anyone's research this, please comment because I couldn't find any source. <laughs> earlier than Atabari, who's a Persian Mohammedan who dies in 912. Okay, so the, the Mohammedans come in in the seventh century, they conquest North Africa. There is a very, very strong racist ideology among the Mohammedans, yeah. exalting Arabs over everybody else. Mm -hmm. And you can see this very simply because when you contrast the origin of the church, the origin of the church, first of all, the Hebrew scriptures are not only Hebrew, but they're Aramaic. There's two languages involved. And then the, the New Testament's written in Greek. So we got three different language groups already represented. And then at Pentecost, they all speak this different languages. And so there's never really, there is a dominance of Greek and Latin, obviously, but there's never really a, a sense that this language is, is sort of intrinsically superior. Now, with Mohammedan theology, uh, God literally speaks Arabic because yeah. the Quran is eternal. It is the eternal word of God in Arabic. So there's yeah. a sense that Arabic is literally eternal. Whereas, you know, Christian, we would say that God is even above bad. God, God transcends even our human language. He's the logos per se. Um, the logos upon which all logi are, are based. Um, but for Mohammedans, there is a, uh, there is a higher transcendent ideology based on their theology. This is Sunni Islam, obviously. Uh, the dominant form but um there is so there's a very strong racism against non-arabs and in particular the the there is the arab so the the main african slave trade that goes on from the 8th century into the 1600s is done by arabs the the it is the trans-saharan 
slave trade throughout Africa. And this slave trade is mainly Arabs uh, enslaving black Africans. And the, the curse of Ham is that in, in Atabari is talking is saying that the, the Hamites, who are all the Africans, the, the curse of Ham that is laid in the Holy Scriptures against Canaan goes against all Hamites whatsoever. So there's an idea that because it does say in the text that Canaan is cursed and Canaan will be the slave of, I think it's Shem. I believe, but it's basically subordinating. It's the, essential, the idea is that it's subordinating the Canaanites to the Shemites. And that's why the Canaanites are dominant in the territory of the Shemites. And that's why the Shemites, the, the Abrahamite, the, the Israelites come to conquest against the Canaanites because they're usurper, usurpers. They should, they should be subordinated to the Israelites, but they're not. But this becomes blown up by these slave traders. They say, they take this little verse that's it's specifically designed to talk about the corruption of the Canaanites. And it says in Deuteronomy, I'm sending you in to take the Canaanites because of their wickedness. They're, they're exceedingly wicked, not because the Israelites are really great, just holy people. It's because the Canaanites are so wicked. And if you go into the archaeology, we know that the Canaanites were exceedingly wicked. They were killing their children. They were burning their children to the Moloch. Exceedingly wicked, of course. But the rest of the Hamites were not. The Egyptians were much more civilized. They were not practicing this insane human sacrifice. Obviously, they were pagan. But um, you know, the Hamite, the Hamites, the Egyptians are not. The other Hamites, um, you have the the kingdom of Sheba or Abyssinia, aka Ethiopia, mm -hmm. very civilized civilization. Um, but the Arabs blow up this this curse of Ham into an, a justification for slavery using the the Bible. Now, this is later picked up by a corrupt Italian priest mm -hmm. by the name of, uh, what's his name? Aeneas of Viterbo. And okay. he, he, is, he is like a Terra de Chardin figure because he's for, he has a ton of forgeries that he makes up. It's a terrible, terrible uh, liar, basically. And one of his lies is the, is the curse of Ham. So he spreads this idea that, all the Hamites of Africa are cursed, and so they should be enslaved, which is a just sort of just um, misusing the text of the Bible. Um, but we should also mention also before we talk about the Europeans getting involved with the slave trade. So not only were the Mohammedans doing this whole slave trade, but the the Black Africans themselves were also enslaving each other. This is the other narrative that that yep. gets completely suppressed. Everybody, I mean, the point is everybody's enslaving each other <laughs> and really only the Christians are, are, have, have the, the theology to abolish slavery gradually and reintegrate and reconcile slave and master. So you have the, the, first of all, you have the Ghana empire ending in 13th, the 13th century. Then the Mali empire goes from the 13th century to the 15th century. And that's in West Africa. That besides that, you've got the Kanan Bornu empire back in the eighth century, the empire of Kitara more in Southeast Africa. And you have all these different African empires and you don't get an empire by playing nice with the, with the other tribes. You get an empire by conquesting them, enslaving them and pursuing a racist ideology and this this the racist ideology is still present in africa as it is like you said everywhere this is not simply a white and black issue now it becomes white and black when the europeans in the 1400s they succumb to the temptation to imitate the mohammedans yep. in slave trading the mohammedans have been doing it for a thousand years at this point and not not a thousand years, but 800, 800 years. years. Thank you. Yeah. And they they succumb to the temptation. They start to slave trade. The, the the story that I read was the Portuguese actually they capture some Arabs and the Arabs say, hey hey whoa whoa whoa, bring us back to Africa and we'll give you some black slaves. And the Portuguese are like, whoa, tell us more about these black slaves. <laughs> and this is a so they start this transatlantic slave trade. Pope Eugenius the fourth condemns it in 1435. Yeah, the popes continually condemn it. The slave trade is condemned and condemned and condemned every century. Now, to be fair, the popes were not always consistent because the popes were not always holy people. They were owning slaves. They were also um, they were also capitulating to this economic force that was happening in Europe. And finally, they suppressed the Jesuits, who were the greatest defenders of the slaves. 
in the in 1773 right before the revolutions begin but the most important point to understand about this the racist ideology and the slavery was that it's been practiced by everybody europeans succumb to the temptation to imitate everybody else but ultimately christendom abolished slavery twice first we abolished it in western europe as you said gradually throughout without bloodshed reconciling the slave and master yep. and then again which we'll discuss in a minute later on with the abolitionist movement and the whole movement to abolish the transatlantic slavery which is just a new form of slavery which is far more racist than the others because it was far more racially based yeah and one distinction i think we should make too is um <clears throat> we should make a distinction between racism you know or or what we like i'm talking about modern terms because these terms have meant different things in past i've seen older authors i can't remember where but i've seen them use the term racism with a way that we would say something like racialism and um you know so basically like uh, europe europe uh people don't understand this europe is a country of different races um in the tech in the, in the traditional term of that meaning of that word meaning like tribes and bloodlines of people that are ethnically distinct from other people. Very important point. The French are Franks. The Bavarians are Bavarian. The English are Anglo-Saxon. The Italians are, are, are Romans. They're Latins. Um, you know, the Spanish are Iberians and so on and so forth. Um, the, the Northern Europeans, you know, Scandinavians, they are Scandinavians. And Finns are not Scandinavian. They're actually Finns, um, you know, and, and the Russian, you know. So the point is, is that... Um, these different groups and these different countries in Europe are of different races. If what you mean is, and, and people who know, again, um, you know, this, this 25 cent history, this cheap history that people have is so dangerous because again, there's no such thing as quote unquote, like a black race anymore. There's something as a white race. When you grow up around people as I did from Africa, from all parts of Africa, I went to a Catholic school in inner city and a, biggish city lots of refugees and so forth and most of the refugees that came to our school were obviously catholic so i got to know a bunch of we call our school colombian central high school because it was so many latinos there it was catholic central high school but we called it colombian central high school but the other predominant group was from places like rwanda and, and eritrea because they had gone through the major conflicts in the 1990s with the um, genocide and they're catholic because they're french you know french background whatever you talk to them and you realize first you realize people from Africa look differently. Like if you get to know somebody, they look differently in the same way that, you know, you, Tim being Northern European background from a guy from Sicily look very different, even though you're both quote unquote white. It's like, well, that's silly. Um, <clears throat> you know, I worked with a, a guy from um, Eastern Russia. Like he was from near the Chinese border, but he was an international student. And we were talking about how he grew up. And I'm like, we grew up in different universes. I mean, but we're both white uh, but it was like we were it was there was no similarity between us whatsoever. And in Africa, think there's things are the same thing. I mean, so even when we when we it's racist, ironically, to make these distinctions between people of different races simply because of their skin color, because even amongst those people, sure, they share a similar tone and skin, but their um, bloodlines, their backgrounds and a lot of actual characteristics of the way that they look when you actually look closely are radically different than everybody else. So we should distinguish too between this idea of what we today call racism versus this idea that there is a racialized nature to nations. Um, because that is something that people don't want to admit about themselves is that people who are from a culture tend to like to marry people and create community with people from that culture. Now, because we have this melting pot in North America, to us, it looks like it's a distinctly race, racial line thing. But it's not, as I've just explained, whereas in places like Europe and Africa, where you have people of the same skin color, but of different bloodlines, it's not about the skin color. It's about the way that you live your life. Um, and the distinctions might look like less to us who don't grow up in these cultures and see. But there's nothing wrong with people having a national sentiment and just historically, because obviously with bloodlines, you tend to look like each other. We look at it as if these nations are, are, are carved out because of skin color. It's not, they're carved out because of tribe. And for us in North America, we see that because of skin color. So there's a difference between 
the racism of hating somebody because they have a different skin color, which is evil, and the history of nations, which is kind of made on racial lines because of tribes. Yeah, I think what you're, uh, I think one of the biggest things is language. If you speak the same yes. language, that's the specific thing that yeah. really <laughs> brings you together, especially. I mean, if you're, if somebody's of a different skin color, but they speak the same language, that's going to yeah. bring them together. Like that's, that's the idea of when somebody becomes a naturalized citizen of another country, um, yes. they really, they, tr they blend in and they learn the language. And especially when you learn the language, that's something that, that really makes you sort of accepted and, and naturalized and grafted into the nation. Um, but you, I, I think you're making a good distinction there be, because like there is a, um, there certainly is a natural rational tendency to simply gravitate towards your own cultural people. That's, I think that's natural because it's unnatural for people to just mix totally like they have in North and South America. That's, that's sort of an, a, a weird thing, a weird yes. thing that was created by um, colonization, but God worked through a place like New Spain, like Our Lady of Guadalupe, revealing yep. herself as a Nuadal Indian, yep. speaking Nuadal, um, and then helping <laughs> all of the Spain Spaniards and the Indians to intermarry and creating a brand new race. That's right. And that's that's really and that's that is the only way, in my opinion, that's the only way to heal racism, because yep. if you it, then you can actually have a new culture where there's a new people. Otherwise you have what you have multiculturalism, which means you're nothing. You, you just have no meaning. There's no, there's nothing. And it's just a bunch of jumble of all sorts of colors, cu cultures like we have in America. We have just all sorts of cultures that all have different values. And we're all just supposed to believe in this, just, just all tolerate each other. We're not going to become one people as is normal. That's what's normal. That's what normally happens. People become a people. We can't become a people. We're just going to all tolerate each other because we can't stand each other. <clears throat> We're not going to do, uh, you know. So I think that if there is a sort of a, an accident of history sort of thing where there is a mixing of races, which is sort of unnatural, but it, as it happened, I think that's the only way that it can be made natural again, I guess, is that, that inter, intermarriaging. Um, yeah. the, solution is, the solution is Christ. Shocker. Yeah. Jesus Christ fixes things. Yeah. So the, and that, that can, I mean, what you, what you have in new Spain, when you have everybody's baptized, everybody goes to Holy communion, you can be ordained, you know, there that you have the cultus, the very cultural meaning of the society is that everybody goes to the same communion rail. It's really hard to yes. enforce a racial ideology on top of that very difficult i mean they tried well, obviously this, all the full-blooded spaniards were the elite rich people they were trying to do that obviously but it failed this is why you know you want to talk about diversity etc there's no place that's more diverse in the natural sense of the word of just people coming together with a common goal than a catholic church you <laughs> there know? you go there seriously you go go to a go to a city like toronto or whatever um <clears throat> now yeah sorry go to a city like toronto go to go to a place where there's a cathedral uh, in the heart of a place where there's tons of immigration and you'll see Filipinos, Polish, Irish, Mexican, Italian, um, you know, Anglo, whatever, um, you know, uh, African Catholics, everything. You'll see literally every single, every single race that is represented in your country. There will be representatives of that race there. And theoretically, not a single one of them have any problems with each other whatsoever and after they might go have coffee and donuts together um their kids will go to school together they'll hang out with each other they'll go to youth group together etc there is no there, there there is there is no distinguish there this, this is what saint paul is talking about when they're jew nor greek nor you know male nor female um meaning the distinct that the, the uh, immutable characteristics between us our skin color gender whatever those things are just physical and they matter i mean i'm not but 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 this, but they're not the things that uh, they don't separate us in a way of of um, not being able to live together, et cetera. And um, in this world where we've embraced enlightenment ideals, evolutionary ideals, um, you know, naturalism, materialism, whatever, we can't figure out racism. 
You know, I've grown up in a country where literally in Canada, multiculturalism is a law. Like we have it in our codes of, you know, human rights, conduct, wherever it is. We have a very vague modernist kind of laws. We have it somewhere where we are like, dis- we are, we are designated. I think it was something one of the Trudeaus did where they distinguished us as like the world's first officially multicultural nation. And it's like, okay, that's, you're, that's a pretend honor you just made for yourself because like they've been anyway, but anyway, but I live in a country where that's the case, but we still can't stop talking about racism. Whatever you're trying to do is not working. You know, like it's funny again, I'm born in 1988. So I'm kind of, you and I are same age. We're kind of in between this, we're like the end of, we're like the higher age of the millennials. Okay. Um, but we're kind of the children of boomers. So I'm kind of in this age where I remember early nineties going to school. We had this very simple concept. Your race doesn't matter. That was the concept. Shocker. It was this very simple concept of you're just a person. It's all good. Okay. But then I've seen it morph as multiculturalism here in Canada has taken root as an ideology. I've seen it morph into this lens through which people see everything And now everybody, younger than me especially, is obsessed with race. I'm like, I thought we were supposed to be over this. We fixed this. It was called don't be an idiot. And now it's turned into, anyway, it's a total mess. And it's like, guys, whatever you're doing is not working. Whereas somehow 100 years ago in this super racist North America, you could have people from all over the globe marrying each other and going to the same church. And there wasn't a problem whatsoever. So whatever we're doing is not working. And the solution, like with funds, is the Catholic Church. Yeah, so it seems to be that the racist ideology was unsuccessful in both New France and in New Spain. But it was successful in the United States. <clears throat> the idea of the curse of Ham was promoted by slave-owning Protestants who were heretics, and they were trying to promote this idea that the Hamites, the, the Af- Black Africans, were cursed by God and and it was sort of ordained by God to enslave them. Unfortunately, the Catholic bishops in the United States did not deal with this properly. They should have been denouncing this error, but they wanted to get along with the Joneses. Uh, Gregory XVI in the 1830s condemned the slave trade. Once, Just another papal condemnation that they've been doing since the 1400s, which was not was not uh, cheered by the Catholic bishops of the United States either. But what happened was, because what, what I think what you're getting at, Kennedy, is what, what I think the Marxists don't really care about racism. They no, really don't care cool. about racism. or They don't care about poverty. If they cared about poverty, they'd promote marriage because marriage is, a, is the antidote to poverty. They don't but care about human beings. All they want is sexual liberation. And, and I think that yeah. this is, this is, I think is, this is the historical thread, I think, that explains what's going on. Because, so 1848, the Seneca Falls Convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she's an abol- abolitionist, and she writes the Declaration of Sentiments. And this is the, we hold these truths to be self evident that all men and women are created equal. And then it's a list of all the, the it's, a, it's the first feminist convention. So what she's doing is she's using a real discontent, as I read from Kirk, everybody that revolutionaries use real human discontent, which is the Africans enslaved by Europeans based on an error from the, an error, erroneous interpretation of the Bible. And she's using that real indica- in real discontent for sexual liberation so she's using this for feminism and what seems to be the case especially when you read um so if you read all the biography of malcolm x you start to see this when he in uh, chapter six and following where he starts to describe what's happening in the post world war one era 1920s which is really the first sexual revolution properly called is when <clears throat> what happens is, and this is this is actually brought out by Jones in uh, Dion- Dionysus Rising, because Nietzsche over in Europe was trying to create revolution, a revolution of values, transvaluation of values, which was yep. removing all logos based values to pure voluntarism, pure will, pure power. That was Nietzsche. And 
he was trying to do this by music and he was yeah. trying to use he what he identified actually in Bizet was that it, he thought it was African. Now, I don't think many of the Europeans had many con the continental Europeans had much contact with Africans, but obviously in the United States, there were a lot of Africans, people of African descent. And there, be, there began to be after World War One this obsession with what by white liberals of the African. And the reason is because they were they were trying to use, quote unquote, the African for sexual liberation. And what I mean by the African, quote unquote, is because they viewed in, in a very erroneous way, they viewed the Africans as just primitive, sexual liberated, sexually liberated people, which is not the case at all. They're just looking at them in a in a in a, in a uh, prejudiced and erroneous way to try to use them for their own sexual liberation. And so what happens is in the 1920s is there's this massive white uh, flight to Harlem yep. to have sexual liberation in Harlem to all this, what, what Malcolm X says, all this white money gets flow, it, it, it gets flows into the, the Harlem Renaissance in an attempt to create a sexual liberation where, which is uniting uh, blacks and whites for sexual liberation. <clears throat> and this is now, obviously some Africans go for that because they want money, but people like Malcolm X understood that, that the, the white man, quote unquote, yep. yeah, it's just exploitation. That's all it is. I mean, this is just the Africans aren't any more sexual than any other culture. It's just, they, they look at the, the African culture with ryth rhythms and that type of thing. And they think that the, the white uh, European think that it's some, some sort of, some sort of sexualized nature, but what happens is they create an entire industry, a commercialized industry, especially with the jazz music and later with the rock and roll and on and on and on to sexualize everything yep. into this sexual liberation. And so this is why I think the and the, the, this is what what really melds in the 1960s where you have Martin Luther King, but you also have Bayard Rustin, who is one of his right hand men, who is a gay rights activist. And you have all of this sexual liberation gets melded with the civil rights movement. And that's because of this spirit, this unholy alliance where all of these people of European descent are trying to have an unholy alliance. It's like the opposite of the mixed marriages in, in New Spain. It's to the complete opposite because they're trying to mix with the Africans, but they're trying to basically have just sexually abuse the Africans to try to create a sexual revolution. It's always, it's always about sex with these people, like with yeah. these, um, uh, like the libertines, you know, liberals. Like, I mean, every, Mar every Marxist, every enlightenment thing, you see it in France with the uh, strip tease and things like that under Robespierre to, you know, evoke the lusts and the people Marquis to become violent. It's always like, it, it, do we people need more? Do this is why they don't teach you real history in school, because if you learned real history, you'd go, my goodness, everything that I've been told from the narrative is a total lie, and every time a society falls away from the church, it becomes insane. This is insane. Like the treatment of the the treatment of minority peoples by their so-called liberal friends is always a form of race hustling and exploitation. The true treatment of people it, like if you're a minority person in a country and it could be your white in africa it could be your whatever wherever you are a minority and you want to have equal treatment amongst people the solution is always the church the solution is always the church whereas if you separate society from that you always turn into a debased post-christian neo-pagan mess where everything becomes this marxist darwinist masonic evolutionist idea where you're going to look at people as almost like types of, of of breeds of animals and you're going to have your fun with them and it 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 escapes no society there's a reason why america and canada whatever but like there's a reason why you have christendom and then you have america which is kind of like the world's first enlightenment empire because okay in europe you have um, you know, France was influenced by the Enlightenment, but it was still a Catholic nation that struggled within itself. You know, you see that even in even in England, it's okay, it's Protestant, but it's still like the Magna Carta. Everyone, you know, I was listening to these Protestant preachers who were quite good the other day, but they were at this this worship protest or whatever. This is like a month and a half ago against the lockdown, and they kept citing all these documents, Magna Carta and Alfred the Great and stuff. I'm like, you guys love the Catholic faith. <laughs> 
Magna Carta is a great Catholic document, you know, from the 1200s. They're saying from the 1200s. I'm like, before Protestantism was invented. I think. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for anyway. But um, so even England, though, has a Catholic framework to it for the most part. Um, that's probably why Catholicism was more accepted in common law New Eng and uh, in Canada, British North America. But anyway, but um, so but when you have America is the first fully enlightenment based, basically country. Like, I mean, it's kind of Protestant ish, but then the government is fully based on labor principles. Of course, this is where you're going to have this continual race struggle because it's based on this heretical naturalist ideology with a little touch of Protestant morals, if you want or not in the background. And it's been a total mess ever since. Again, the solution is the church. Absolutely. So we have today the, so Martin Luther King Day today, people use the figure of Martin Luther King as this figure, which helps to prop up the Marxist sexual liberation, which is melded with the civil rights movement, because it, it's, it's the same spirit of exploitation of the African culture for the sake of this liberation. Now, I think that once the archives are unearthed, unfortunately, Martin Luther King was a great man, <clears throat> a great man. Um, and I think in particular, one of my favorite moments in his life is 1955 when he, when he leads the Montgomery bus boycott. And then he, after the boycott ends and they win against the, the, the Jim Crow in Montgomery, he says, you need to forgive your enemies because these white people were just taught that from their youth. They don't know how to deal with black people, you know? I think that was a great moment in his life. But later on, it, it does appear that he did lose touch with his Christian roots. I think really when the archives are all, what was that? Didn't he become, like, wasn't he a socialist eventually? Well, more or less? Um, I think there is a great deal of evidence that he was very unfaithful to his wife in, in yeah. a very bad way, not just a one-time thing. Um, and that was, apparently that's been, unearthed in various FBI archives because they were the FBI was after them trying to get him to go down and, and kill himself. Actually, they were trying to make him commit suicide to try to blackmail him because they knew all of his dark secrets. <clears throat> but unfortunately, I think once the archives are unearthed, if they ever are, because he's sort of a canonized saint at this point by the Marxist liberals. So they're yeah. probably going to try to prevent as much as possible any of these archives to come out. But um, the it, it does appear that he was had a, had a dark side, unfortunately. And that's, and it, he was a great rhetorician, a uh, great preacher. Uh, but unfortunately, when you, when you look at his, I have a dream speech, it's essentially yeah. Masonic. Uh, it's yeah. basically just Kumbaya Jews and Gentiles. Let's all just sit down at the table of brotherhood and say free at last. And yeah. ultimately this is just the voluntarist freedom. Yeah. The idea that you are as good as what you can do. Therefore, if you have political power, you then are truly liberated, but that's, that's false. That's a false liberation. You don't get liberation simply by having political power just yeah. because you can vote. That's not liberation. That's simply you. Okay. You can exercise certain rights. And sometimes that's a good thing. Wait, Tim, voting is the best thing ever. And yeah. it always is honest <laughs> and it's freed everybody from all lies and falsehoods. And every I'm sorry, I misspoke that. I'm sorry. It's the best place to ever live. Let's detract that. I didn't YouTube. I didn't say anything about elections. Wasn't me. No, I'm talking about voting. I'm not. Ta I'm not talking about elections. You're going off the deep end. I'm talking about voting. I live in a place where we voted in a premier, and this guy that we voted for, he does everything that we want. In fact, he's so good at doing what we want that he locks us in our houses because we didn't even know we wanted that, but we voted for it. Voting is the best uh, thing as ever. As Charles Kalum said perfectly, we have the best governments that money can buy. Exactly. That's the perfect way to say it. Well, I, I'm going to repeat also, that over and over. And also, as you're saying about the Martin Luther King, I have a dream thing. It's not a lasting solution, again, because, again, all heresies, they play on a partial truth. Okay, from a from a perspective, we've always had tolerance in the Catholic faith. Thomas Aquinas talks about tolerance, okay, like in various ways. Like, yes, from a from a perspective of inheriting a pluralist society, that's what we have. The best thing you can do is tolerate each other sometimes because you have differences that are, for all intents and purposes, irreconcilable. Okay. And um, 
people like to pretend that when they're all enlightened and they're liberal, whatever, that, oh, there's no differences. It's like, no, because you just hate people who don't believe what you believe and you just show it in different ways. Everybody does that in, in, from a general perspective. So Martin Luther King's appeal to people was basically stop the petty fighting, live your life as a citizen and just kind of be happy. There's an appeal to that because there's a great partial truth in that. But that as the foundation, it's a feeling. It's not a truth. It's a feeling. It's not a, it's not a foundation. Yeah, that's a good feeling. You know, I mean, you, wartime, it was, you know, during wars and you're going and fighting and you forget about it and you just go for your country. But even there, it's not lasting because once the war is over, you realize that you don't have as much in common as you thought you did when it comes to daily life. Once, you're, once the existential threat is gone, what is it? Right. So uh, it hasn't been lasting. And in Canada, in America, in Europe, and all places that have rejected the church, they're still dealing with racial struggles. And no single solution of any of these idiot politicians will ever fix it. And um, if you believe in history, then you'll see that every single application of an enlightenment ideal to try to fix the problems between various cultures only makes things 100% worse. For evidence of that, see the last summer and the city's burning down. Um, you see the problems here in Canada. I mean, we have our, I won't go bore the American viewers too much, but we have our own problems where we have, we have such a, we have such a non-racist past in Canada, relatively speaking. We really do. Again, we didn't have that many people. It's a totally different history than the States in so many ways. We have our problems, but compared to the States, we never had chattel slavery or anything like that. But we are so obsessed with race that we import American, there was a, I said this in one of our episodes, like in the summer, there was a, a, um, a Black Lives Matter event or something in Northern Alberta. They had to cancel it because there weren't any black people to come to. <laughs> yeah. And it was organized by white people. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you don't, you have your own problems, okay? Maybe you have problems with the First Nations. Maybe you have problems with poverty, but you don't have that problem. But we're so obsessed with it that we have to import the problem. Yeah. Guys get over it you know and, and the solution to all of that is the church yep absolutely i think that's the that's the main thing we, we've tried to present today <clears throat> is there's there's really been no proven solution throughout history except for the roman catholic church yeah and the roman christ. catholic civilization christ even Whether in the imperfect even even william wilberforce you know who did a good job in, of abolishing the slave trade in England, he was a Protestant of some sort, but at least from a philosophical perspective, he got it. He understood, he understood that if I'm going to call myself a Christian, I can't do this because he, he understood, he understood the Christian anthropology. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the main thing is the cosmology and the metaphysics because the, there is no metaphysical reason to, or cosmological reason for an evolutionist Marxist materialist to deny racism. Exactly. Why not just do it? There's no, re you have no reason not to Marxist. There's no reason. It fits the ideology perfectly. It's actually beneficial yeah. to the idea yeah. of the So you, being. you can just, all they, they can do is because they're voluntarist is they just impose the, the, the Christian philosophy of, of the, you know, the brotherhood of man in Christ onto the Masonic, brotherhood of man and they transpose that and they create this masonic world but they can't really do that truly without christianity without rational philosophy so right. let's offer up in our father i, I, I want to pray especially for our bishops because i think this is a, a thing that they really latch on to racism and yeah. that there may be a true a true, but like we said, in the, especially in the United States in the 19th century, the Catholic bishops were not dealing with this properly. They were trying to get along with the Joneses, and I, I, I fear that they're trying to get along with the Joneses once again. So it's very important that we have a, uh, a proper understanding of uh, what is racism, what is not racism, and then we right. can have a proper appreciation for martin luther king and what he was doing and what he was not doing mm -hmm. and and properly evaluate these individuals who were doing things their successes and their failures so let's pray in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen
Pane Nostrum, quotidianum da nobis odie, de meti nobis de vita nostra, sicurta nostri miti mus territoribus nostri, se ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Nomine Patris, et Filii, Spiritus Sancti. Amen.